Good morning comrades, welcome back to the channel, welcome back to the Nürburgring here at Apex and welcome to the second video of series called Green Hell Tactics where we tell you about the driving dynamics, different tactics, different all kinds of things that should essentially eventually make you a better driver. In the first video we talked about the absolute foundation, the fundamentals, the seating position. Today we move on to I would say maybe even more important, but two aspects that should actually keep you safe on the track, namely braking. And as you can see, I'm joined by George, and this means that we'll be actually getting technical because we'll be actually making two or maybe eventually three videos where we later on talk about the different braking techniques. But for now, we'll actually talk about the hardware, about the components, because you actually should know how the braking system is working, how it is being operated, and how actually it is influencing other components and eventually the driving dynamics of the car. So let's get started. So let's go to that side of the car because, well, what happens when you pre press brake pedal? Majority of you should know where the brake pedal is. It's either in the middle or on the left side of the braking. <laughs> but in any case, what happens when you press the brake pedal? It activates the master cylinder of your brake system. Most of the brake systems are actually hydraulic operated. This means that they have fluid inside them. Of course, you have also brake by wire, especially nowadays with EVs. There's a, they're a lot more complicated. But for now we go towards the basics. You have the brake pedal activating the master cylinder that pushes the fluid it throughout the brake system. So what we can see here, however, on top is actually the ABS pump. We will get more into that later, what the ABS system does, but in short, it means anti-blocking system. It will, it will avoid your wheels from locking up. But let's do a quick fast forward to the actual wheel hub and the braking system that you are familiar with seeing. So let's raise the car up. All right, now we are armed with these little helpers, our lights. Okay, let's get back series to the point. The fluid is going through your ABS system and then it ends up here in your braking line over here that you can see. The fluid is being sent towards the brake caliper, this one that you know, and inside you have brake pistons and the pistons are pressing the brake pad against the brake disc. The brake disc this one over here, which is mounted on your wheel hub, and at the same time your wheel is also mounted at, is being stopped by brake calipers, uh, or yeah, brake caliper and brake pads squeezing the brake discs, and that's how essentially, eventually, your car comes to a stop. That's a, quite a simple explanation, visual explanation. And now first, let's explain why we uh, change some of those components, some of those par uh, parts, and I think George should take over for now. Okay. We don't change any master cylinders unless you actually change the complete brake system, unless you go for a different caliper setup on an old school car and you actually need to have like a more braking force. That's again, like a quick info. A lot of people go like, well, on the E46, you could change it. I mean, that's that we can explain that when we come to the videos on the Starlet this year, because that's one thing I can really go into depth with because it's something I experienced. So, exactly. so we could probably explain that more after for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot more, but okay. Basics, majority of people just end up replacing those components and why it's not only about to increase your stopping power but it's also to provide safety and the first one is the actual brake fluid that is operating the whole system and why is that you have with brake fluids um, you have obviously different types of fluids the misconception of dot 5.1 is way better than dot 4 and all this kind of stuff basically the long and short of it is you have your different fluids Basically, the more racing fluid has a higher boiling point. You have a wet and dry boiling point. Um, and essentially, a stock fluid would maybe have like a 200 degree boiling point, And you'll have something like a Super Dot 4 from, let's say, Endless, um, which will have more like a 293 degree wet boiling mm -hmm. point. So you have your different boiling points. Obviously, the higher the boiling point, the more reliable the fluid will be from essentially boiling and steam but basically generating in the lines that's mm -hmm. basically what you what you get so obviously at this point the most noticeable difference is the the, the feeling in your pedal so you're essentially with a brake pedal with the braking system you're pushing the pedal and that fluid in the whole system from end to end is like a solid it's, it's a solid rod you can imagine it as a solid mm -hmm. metal rod so that you push it one end it pushes the pistons in the caliper you well see that comes back it's always acting as a rod if the fluid boils that then obviously compresses because you've got 
bought with fluid. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point, it's the same as air in the line as well. You press the pedal and you're compressing it first before it moves. Mm -hmm. So the fluid is probably one of the most important things on a track car that you want to make sure is always change regularly and really like a good fluid. Mm -hmm. And in case you're wondering why is the fluid boiling, because as mentioned, the operation of the way the brake system works, it is actually friction. So when you, the brake pads are pressing against the brake disc, they create lots and lots of heat. And that heat is being transcended throughout the whole system. Also, is eventually also into your suspension. That's why race suspensions are running extended reservoirs. But here you can even see that the brake caliper has changed color due to the heat Tra transformation that, is, that the heat is going through it. So it is very important to change your brake fluid first to avoid that overheating, overboiling, and eventually pressing the brake pedal and nothing is happening because it's falling through because your uh, fluid has boiled. Okay, let's move on to the next component. And those are the brake lines that we are replacing. And again, the same reason for that is to make sure that you have consistent pressure consistent feeling because on stock cars, the stock versions of brake lines are usually made out of rubber or some sort of silicon, equivalent rubber, silicon. Yeah, it's a strange metal. Strange it's uh, you, you, cost effective that's a, on, for mass production, but for high performance versions, it can expand, especially for older versions, it can corrode, like rubber can become hard and it can eventually simply burst. That's what you don't want to have on the track bursting brake lines. So what you end up doing is replacing them by these metal versions yeah. of them. Metal braided lines, simple yeah, as that. That's, that. That's a very simple explanation. It's a very cost effective, it's very cheap, like a set of lines might, might cost you like good ones with tooth approval, like 80 euros or so. Yeah, 100 euros, something around that. And, but it's, it's very important. Like those are the basic things that, that you should do in any track car. Now moving on, the caliper actually does not need any replacing unless we're talking about any old cars. If, 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 of course, if you go into like professional driving on an old car, and even with a new car, you want to have the best of absolutely best, then you would go to either bigger caliper or maybe even similar size, but maybe uh, like a lot of not only Formula One calipers, but aftermarket calipers are a single block calipers. So what this means, like you can see on this side, it's kind of a two two sides, left and right, they're being bolted together, and that's, again, cost-effective method. If you want to go full Formula One spec and go very expensive, it's one piece of block of uh, either aluminum or whatever it is it's, it's being milled out of, and when it's one single piece, you have no flax in the caliper. We're talking about micromillimeters here of flaxing. Weird flax, bro, I know. But if you want to go for ultimate performance, and when it comes again Formula One, you want these extra micro nanometers to, to be involved there. So as you can see on this car, on the F80 series, on the M4, it's actually not really necessary to replace it because the BMW actually got their stuff together. Like yeah, they, the, know, they on, know what they're doing. On, on the previous uh, models, uh, you would replace them, but actually now it works. Now, one of the most frequently changed components is the brake pad. Why is that? Again, first of all, is of course to provide the more initial bite or just like also overall braking uh, power, but it's also the way your street pads are operating, and we're gonna get to that in the second part of the video, is the way you brake on the street and the way they actually th taught you in driving school how to drive. You go slowly on the brakes, and then if necessary, you go harder on the brakes, and then at the very end you release. And it's actually very small micro braking because you never drive uh, on the limit on the street. So the, actually the braking temperatures are extremely low. When you go on track driving, you need to do completely opposite. You need to stamp on the brake, stab and then squeeze. And then the brake temperatures, ex ex like they go rapidly up. So basically with a street caliper, you can finish it in half a lap on the Nürburgring, like, or even one lap, or it depends. So you need to work with different brake temperatures. And that's where you end up going with different compounds and different uh, also price levels and price ranges, etc., etc. Now we run endless, in this case, MA45B in most of our cars. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do say like, hey, uh, endless is quite expensive, but we also say you get what you pay for. Um, and it has to do with the fact that A, it works under every temperature. We can run it in cold, in wet, in, in, in hot. You will have consistent performance and you have also longevity and durability. And this car can run like, how, how long would you last on a set of brake pads? 
that's a tricky one. Anything between 100 and 150 laps, really. It depends on the type of yeah, driver, depends of course. On the type of driver. We, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The biggest thing is, is with a good pad, which you'll obviously pay for, um, is how it wears and how it deals with the wear. Mm -hmm. You'll get a, a cheaper pad. I'm not going to name any brands because I can't off the top of my head, but you'll get the pad will wear wedge-shaped. So you end up having one end of the pad with like two mil and one end of the pad with six mil. Mm -hmm. And this can be down to the caliper and stuff as well, but we have seen it where that is the case with a cheaper pad because it just doesn't deal with the heat so well. Mm -hmm. um, you go onto something like an endless pad, it wears evenly all the way down to the end. And even when there's like not much pad material left, you still get a, not a terrible feeling pedal off. It's normally you yeah. get no pedal. So yeah. this is why with the more expensive pads and the pads that work, it's not always the expensive ones, but most mm -hmm. of the time is because it's just how it is. It's how it works. And one final thing, what a lot of people actually complain about when it comes to performance pads is the noise level. Uh, like with other uh, brands is that uh, a very good example was on the Porsche 993 I was driving last year. You would have lots of squeaking, lots of squealing. And some people like it, of course, but other people also like pops and bangs on their Ford Fiesta. Nothing wrong with that. It depends on what you like. But at the end of the day, you probably want to have actually like a smooth operation and not being too too loud and too noisy and uh, these pads don't have it. Um, but it's just like, uh, and uh, the noise level comes again from the type of uh, material that is being used for the brake pads. And then the final component here is the brake disc. So why do you need to change the brake disc and why do you need to pay attention to that? Um, so it's again, car dependent. Mm -hmm. um, in this, As you can see, in this case, we're running stock disc. Of course, in, in some cases, like stock disc is fine. In some cases, when the discs are made correctly, the drilled discs are actually okay. A lot of people like never run drilled because they crack. Yeah, if it's a cheap disc, of course it will. If the process isn't done correctly, of course it will. Um, so yeah, you have different types of discs, obviously. So if you're on an old school car with a, a thin disc, obviously your, your overall thickness of the disc, the main point is if you want your discs to last longer as you go for a thicker disc to obviously with calipers to allow etc mm -hmm. um, because heat uh, thicker disc will not only last longer in terms of like the the material will last longer but it also means more material can uh, like dissipate the dissipate heat, the heat yeah. and uh, you will have also better overall on track performance yeah of course by thicker you can also go bigger in size but provides more consistent and better braking force so there are lots of variables you can go onto the brake disc yeah i mean you've got drilled grooved drilled and grooved carbon fiber yeah this but there, this not that would be again ceramics. it's going to go um, way, way too much. yeah j hooks you've got all these different types of discs but obviously it's it's a uh, you need to get them working hand in hand with the brake pad. It's not a case of, oh, I'm just going to chuck a really expensive brake disc on and it'll work on that setup. It, it really does depend. Um, so obviously in this case, like we say, we've got the stock disc, which works perfect on this car. The drilled, it lasts ages. I, I don't even, can't even put a lap time on it, but a lap count on it, it lasts forever. Um, yeah, on some cars we run just groove, groove discs, like the endless, we run J-hooks now on the, on the, um, on the Yaris. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it really does depend. You've got loads of different variables, but the overall mainly is the, the way the disc gets rid of the heat. So this, this is a, a rotational disc. So you'll see the veins in the disc point a certain way. So as the disc spins, it pushes the heat through and out of the disc. And that's a, another really important thing with, with some discs. Mm -hmm. um, not all of the discs are rotational, but the, yeah. normally the most performance ones are they yeah. will be so. yeah and sometimes you have uh, even also have, have like a single piece disc instead of yeah, yeah, ventilated a disc, on, on, a ventilated on older disc. on the older two part disc where we, with the extra hat where you like yeah. you, we can go Full on so floating. much so much into detail that there are many variables but this is basically the like already very detailed fundamentals of how the brake system works now another important component and why we are standing here and why we have the wheel office when you brake what happens here is your car actually pitches. It goes to the front. So the suspension is actually being squeezed in as well because of all the forces are going to the front. And this is before we go into the suspension part in one of the upcoming videos is why you should consider actually upgrading your suspension and not go too much into upgrading your braking system too much because it can unsettle the car. And the weight balance is an extremely important feature of any racing driving or driving dynamics like this whole traction cir circle. So let's quickly touch on the brake bias because 
fundamentals of the having like an equal breaking force when all the components are in balance. As we, you hear quite often like the, like the, the break bias and the break balance is um, on the front, you need to have bigger brakes because again, when you brake, more weight is being shifted to the front. So therefore the front brakes need to deal with more of the, the braking force. That's why you have the mechanical, so to say, distribution of brake bias. This means you have bigger brakes on the front in comparison to the rear. So we can quickly have a look on the back ones, which are smaller. So Probably a good thing to highlight is it's not the overall diameter, it's more the surface area and yes. the, the caliper, the piston size, that's a lot to do with it. Exactly, so you can see here only just one single, one like two piston, one on the left side, one on the other side or the outside, outer side and the inner side and just uh, the, the brake disc size as well slightly. Now another just like an interesting fact, like a nerd fact, for example, you can see on the, some newer cars, uh, cars, especially EVs on the Audi Q4, they even dr run drum brakes because they actually use regen forces more. And they told me, the engineers that uh, worked on the Q4, they say we had to install drum brakes because the rear discs, otherwise like the brake disc would not get activated and they would just rust away. So in case you're wondering why certain cars are still running like now all of a sudden technology of a century ago, this is why it's like more cost effective. But that's when it comes to brake bias, but moving forward with our logic of this video, it is very important to keep in mind of the brake bias. What quite people, people do wrong quite often is they install massive brake caliper and like disc on the front of their car. Eight piston, Eight, 12, yeah, 12, yeah. 16 piston and then they keep the rear stock for the cost effective reasons or whatnot. And also the master in the stock in that case. Exactly. So that's another story. <laughs> and then you go full on the brakes and if your brakes at least operate, but the rear is like not working at all or it will lock up it. It's you always need to have a good balance in your whole of system. Um, I think that's pretty much it when it comes to all the components that we uh, we talked about. Maybe we can go more into detail about what like we have actually components taken apart yep. and we can show what is actually happening and the parts of what that you should do and do not in certain cases. So we have our components here, the brake caliper, the brake pads and the brake discs. And what we want to show to you is how to brake properly again here, not by showing you how to do it on the road. We'll get to that point later on during the year to make sure that you not only keep yourself safe, but also your components and avoid like things like this happening. What this exactly is, we'll get into that in a second. But George, tell us, how should we break properly? <laughs> right, okay, so <laughs> a couple of variants. This is just throwing me straight in the deep end. Yes. Uh, no, a couple of variants. You've got obviously your, your pad material. You have all, many different compounds, which is your, your pad material, which is this chunk here, which is on the back plate. Um, so when you bed pads in, we'll start off with the basis of it. Well, when you bed pads in, you're doing a procedure to, to put, literally put this material onto this material. You're basically transferring materials from, from one surface to another to, to make the surfaces, to make the materials. So once that is a big key to your, I think obviously this is why you have brake discs like this, this kind of like out of the factory, this, weird rough surface because it obviously helps with the transfer of the of the material from the pads so that's your first your first step of of making sure the pads going to work that's how you get your cold bite that's how i mean if you read any of the manufacturer's instructions you'll see there's a there's different ways of doing it and this actually should actually uh, it also shows that you are breaking more like a brake pad material against brake pad material not brake pad material against the brake disc it, exactly yeah exactly so so that's that's your first step of of your of your braking. Now, when you you hear a lot of people say, oh, "I've got a terrible vibration on my brakes. My discs are warped." Nine times out of ten, this isn't strictly true. Um, a lot of people will brake too soft, and with a, a certain amount of, of, of pad compounds, braking too soft is not that great because you end up building deposits on the disc. Now that's when material comes off and builds up in high spots on the disc. Um, sometimes on drill disc as well, you'll get build up inside the holes, which also causes vibration. But again, that's another thing. But you'll get high spots of deposits and these get baked onto the disc because of such high temperatures. And you can imagine your disc isn't running, your pad isn't flowing nicely on the, well, your disc isn't flowing nicely on the pad. 
it's more like up and down because obviously it's hitting the high spots and it's hitting the, the low spots at the same time as well. So it's essentially jumping on up and down the disc, very, very small amount. That's where you get your vibration from. So obviously that is a, another, another thing you need to take into account with these pads. You don't want to be just like really gently on the brakes all the time driving like you're on a driving lesson. You want to be able to brake properly. Um, so you've got that as well. Another thing is, I've always said it in a lot of videos, is driving with a system. You have a lot of people drive with a system, which really you've constantly got brake pressure on the, the corners that are slipping. So for instance, we'll go a quick example, front left on a BMW, someone's just pushing the car into a corner and leaning on the MDM. Your front left brake is going crazy. It's constantly grabbing the disc. So your pads are like really grabbing the disc to slow that wheel down to stop you from understeering off the track. And obviously this generates more heat, wears more pad. Um, in instances like when the pad is completely finished on track, you'll wear through the, you'll wear through the material, even at an angle. And then the back plate, you can even end up wearing through the back plate, which in this instance, this happens. So someone's worn through the material, obviously not stopped, carried on going, and it's actually melted the piston, which is this part here. So you can see how deformed it is actually compared to an original piston. So it's, it's pretty bad. Um, so yeah, you, you kind of want to avoid that. As soon as this is worn through, then you have a real big issue because essentially in a caliper, this is, this, is, this is held with a seal. The seal is around the inside and this is a dust cover. Once this happens and it's distorted, the fluid then leaks past the piston and then you have a fluid leak. So, so yeah, that's, that's a, a real do and don't. Of, and now a lot of, of people are going to say like, well, this happened because of the assist systems. So uh, we should drive without ABS, without ESC, without everything. That's of course Partially not true. Partially true. It's, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. The assist system is there to save you. To save you. So if it's intervening, this means something you are doing is happening. Exactly, and I'll say this, MDM in a BMW is a fantastic system to teach you how to drive without someone being next to you teaching you how to drive. Yeah. If you're going on, on a lap, let's just say we're doing a lap on a track day and your MDM light is flashing like crazy and you're constantly fighting the car, you're, you're pushing too much. You need to rein it in and you need to drive more, more sensibly and use that assist system as a, as a guideline. So if you can drive a fast lap, smooth without the assist cutting in, only at Flansgarten and in Carousel, then you're doing a good job and you're really saving your components on your car. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in that sense, it, it, it's a good system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and finally, just to explain how ABS works, because we didn't touch on that, what it does is it avoids your wheels from locking up. So it actually uses multiple sensors to see how the speed difference is between the wheel and the well, the and the surface, the, the speed. So basically, when the when the wheel starts to lock, the ABS sensor on the wheel hub will will see if we go to the wheel. It's probably easy to explain. So obviously, as your wheel locks, it's turning, it's turning, it's turning. You slam the brakes, and it locks. At this point, it's sliding, but other wheels are still turning. So the car knows, hold on a minute, this wheel's locked. So this is sliding and the rest of the car's still moving. So we're in, we're in a locked up situation. So then it slowly releases pressure on and off. It like, it's like a tap. And then it allows the wheel to do this under braking. Like, it, you can't really do it because it's difficult. But imagine <laughs> it's slower, but it does this under braking. 15 times per second. All this allows you to do is to be able to maneuver away from whatever you're slamming the brakes on for. It doesn't, this is a massive misconception, it doesn't allow you to stop faster. ABS doesn't allow you to stop faster. In fact, you stop slower. Without ABS, hence the reason why race cars have it, etc. it allows you to stop faster, but it's less safe. So ABS is a safety system, always has been, always will be. And we can- You can get into motorsport ABS systems. Exactly, which I think and we is can also get into a complete detailed video on how like even small changes on your braking system components, like having like a more grippier brake pads will up upset your stock ABS system and destroy this whole balance. But I think by now already, we are approaching half an hour with this video. Yeah, sure. So I think it's time to say goodbye for now. So it's time to say thank you if you made it this far. And we're looking forward to telling you how to actually now use the things, these, these things to your advantage by explaining you various driving techniques. So uh, see you in an upcoming video. Thanks. Cool. Bye -bye. See you guys.